All right, we are in Matthew chapter 22. We are looking at the parable of the wedding feast, the third parable uh, that Jesus tells to convict the Jewish leaders. Remember the parable of the two sons, followed by the parables of the vineyard, and now the parable of the wedding feast, which as you can see is a parable that's unique to Matthew. Basically, two parts to this particular parable. One has to do with reluctant guests and their punishment to them. And then the second part has to do with the, the point about the wedding garment. Okay, so it says, verse 2, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. <laughs> Again, he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatted livestock and are all butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. All right, so there were a lot of people that were interested in the kingdom. <laughs> but once the invitations were made, excuses were given. The slave lines themselves up with God's prophets. God's prophets who had been sent in mass to God's people, inviting them to uh, the coming kingdom. They received more than one opportunity. And even as we studied the Gospel of Matthew, uh, we see they got John the Baptist, and now Jesus is inviting people to the feast. Verse 5 says, They paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized the slaves and mistreated them and killed them. <clears throat> so, some ignore the invitation, some make excuses, and some actually respond violently to the invitation, like it was somehow an interruption into their life and they didn't appreciate maybe a suggestion that they were not already uh, a part of the kingdom. <clears throat> well, that's kind of the way it is uh, with us as we try to preach the gospel. Uh, there are going to be those that ignore us. There will be those that will make excuses. And there will be those that will turn against us in anger. <clears throat> that's just... The way it is, and the way it has always been. Verse 7, But the king was enraged and sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Of course, in the parable, Jesus is providing an illustration that certainly points to the ultimate judgment of God and that the wrath of God is going to eventually be poured out as a matter of fact, Paul calls it in Romans chapter 2, the day of wrath. We talk about the second coming. And we sing about it. We pray about it. And we look forward to it. But it's not going to be a happy day for uh, the majority of the world. And the reason is because that's the day of wrath. That's the day that God's anger is finally going to be vented and poured out in abundance upon those who have snubbed his servants, who have rejected his word, who have ignored his son, and so now it's payback uh, time for them. Verse 8, Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Now, the new guests might be the publicans and sinners. That would be uh, logical that that's who we're referring to. Or it might have an extended application to the Gentiles that the Jews were the first to receive the gospel. And then, as we read about in the book of Acts, uh, once they rejected the gospel, the gospel was then uh, spread to Gentile regions. 
As a matter of fact, Paul spends a considerable amount of time in Romans chapter 11 talking about this very principle that because of the rejection of the gospel by the Jews, that was what sent the gospel to the Gentiles. Now, it was intended to go to them eventually, but uh, because of their rejection, it went there faster than it might have otherwise. Anyway, um, the Jews who were first invited were not worthy. And so now the invitation is going to be extended to others uh, that were considered not worthy, but they're now invited to be a part of God's kingdom. So, verse 10 says, And those slaves went out to the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good. Notice how they were not discriminate at any level. Everybody was invited. There was no filtering of the invitations like there was with the first round uh, where it was only to the Jews. We think about this principle not only in the lives of John and Jesus, and Jesus was already criticized for eating with and fellowshipping with publicans and sinners. But today we still have those that want us to filter to whom we extend the gospel. And uh, that could be something that has to do with race. In my first full-time work, I was told in no uncertain terms that I was not to evangelize uh, the black community. <clears throat> well, this is a city boy from Colorado. I didn't grow up in the South with the prejudice and hatred and all that, so uh, that really was a stunning thing for me. Or it might be economics. We put the students on a campaign foundation <coughs> in another state and as the leaders of that church were giving us campaigners instructions they had already mapped out the part of the city that they wanted us to canvas and I noticed that the poorer parts of the city were not on the area that they wanted us to canvas. And they, well, I asked them about that, and they said, well, we don't need any more of them. We need you boys to, to convert some of the more wealthy people that could actually contribute to the wealth of this church. No, no. How do you respond to that stuff? You don't want to know. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean... Is that another roundhouse story? Because it <laughs> now, I, I said, um, we're packing up and heading back to Denver. Was that why you were a student or a teacher? That's when I was a teacher. I was uh, with the campaigners. From Bear Valley. Yeah. Huh. So I said, we're going home. And I said, those people that are going to be most responsive to our work are those that are in the poor. I mean, we'll, we'll have time to canvas the whole town. But, you know, said, if you're interested in saving souls, that's why we're here. We're not interested in... Yeah. Funneling rich people to church. Uh, anyway, hmm. there was uh, some backpedaling, and we stayed and, and uh, evangelized the poor part of town and baptized three mm -hmm. uh, wow. while we were there. Uh, and uh, so, anyway, but we run into that all the time. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I went back and visited that. By the way, I ignored the admonition in Mississippi as well. <clears throat> <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, I was very pleased to go back and see in that current <coughs> that was my first work uh, was uh, an even balance of, uh, of blacks and whites and they had some Hispanics even in the congregation and they just loved each other and <coughs> they had uh, leadership was balanced I mean it was a good thing so Sometimes you need people to die, and the guy that told me that had uh, died in order to maybe move on with some of those things. But all right, <clears throat> well, our our job, as in the parable of the sower, is to reach into the bag of the gospel and to let it fly, and not to be discriminated as to uh, where the seed is going to fall. Preach the word. And let God uh, do his work on the human hearts upon which it falls. 
<clears throat> but you should, I should never get in a situation where we are predetermining the receptivity of somebody to the gospel. Go invite everybody. And that's what they did. They went into the streets. They gathered together all they found, evil and good. <clears throat> when the king came to look into the dinner guests, he saw there a man not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, Friend, how did you come here without wedding clothes? And he was speechless. Then the king said to his servants, Bind him hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. All right, now, for those of you that were awake when we were introducing uh, the Gospels, I actually use this as an illustration of uh, something that, when I was young, I misunderstood. And it looked like uh, the king was unreasonably harsh. You wanted to go into the highways and byways and bring in everybody, including the poor, and now you find a guy that doesn't have a tuxedo on, and he gets all upset about it. What was it that I was missing? Anybody remember? You said they gave the garments at the door. Yeah, they gave the garments at the door. And so um, this man had determined that he was going to be a part of the wedding feast on his own terms. And that's what was an insult to and enraged the king. So that he responded that the guy needed to be bound and needed to be uh, cast out. So when we think about the wedding clothes provided at the door, there's no excuse not to be properly clothed. We are given the robes of righteousness when we answer the gospel invitation. God gives us the clothes at the door. And as we become a part of his kingdom, we are a part of those who are righteous. But there are those that want to get into God's kingdom on their own terms. Romans chapter 10, Paul talks about how the Jews had developed their own plan of salvation. They were ignoring the righteousness of God and had established their own righteousness. Well, that's exactly what we're talking about here. And as you drive up and down the streets of Denver, you see church after church after church. And what we know about those churches is that they have established their own standard of righteousness. They are wanting to be in a part of God's kingdom, but on their own terms. If we're humble and we acknowledge the inspiration of the Bible, then... We're not going to presume anything outside of what God has revealed. And we're going to do only that which God has authorized. Now I had mentioned as we began uh, a section in chapter 19 and verse 30, but many who will be first, the first will be last and the last first. And then chapter 20, verse 16, thus the last shall be first and the first last. And then chapter 20, verse 27, whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. And now a similar principle, <clears throat> for many are called, but you are chosen. All right, so Jesus sums up this particular parable by saying... The fact of the matter is, the gospel invitation has gone out to all the world. Rome, uh, Colossians 1.23 tells us <coughs> that the world has received the gospel. The Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, in Mark 16, 15, and 16, is to go to all the world, to every creature. Well, many are called, but few are chosen. And Whereas a Calvinist might run uh, too far with that particular terminology, I would say, look again at the parable. 
people were invited to come, and some rejected the invitation, and some accepted the invitation and put on the clothes of righteousness. Well, those were the chosen. So who are the chosen? Those that accept the invitation. Those are the chosen. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 10 tells us that we were called through the gospel. So when you obeyed the gospel, you became a part of the call. Not that there are some Calvinistic viewpoint where God had predetermined or predestined you to salvation, but you became a, a part of the call when you responded to the gospel. These became the chosen when they answered the call to the wedding feast. Second Thessalonians 2.14 all right, the next section is 15 through 22. We find here yet another attempt to trap Jesus. Then the Pharisees went and counseled together how they might trap him in what he said. Now, the, the easier way to trap somebody is in what they do. But if that's not going to work, then go to plan B, which is to get them to say something. And then trap them in that. <clears throat> and they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any. Now this time they send their disciples. Let's send the young pups, loaded them with a, a question, a loaded question. Did they think that Jesus would be caught off guard by these young men? That they might be able to slip in a trap that he would be unsuspecting? Because of these young guys. You know, you're going to have your guard up when the Pharisees and Sadducees come. But you just got some disciples uh, with an innocent question. <clears throat> well, and then we talk about a strange partnership. The text says that they were teaming up with the Herodians. <clears throat> Who are the Herodians? They are Jews that accepted Herod's dynasty. So now you've got the Pharisees who absolutely, absolutely despise the Romans partnering up with Herodians that support the Romans. Now, it just goes to show they all consider Jesus to be a threat. <clears throat> I said probably for different reasons but they consider Jesus to be a threat. Now they say, <clears throat> Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth. First of all, that's a flat-out lie. <laughs> but they're setting up. They, they don't care if they're getting the disciples to, to lie as long as they trap Jesus in what he says. <laughs> they're lying in what they're saying, but they want to trap Jesus in what he says. So they have no idea that he can read their minds and he knows exactly what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Has no, no clue that he could do that. Have they not been exposed to this power at all, or are they just being arrogant? Well, they've been exposed to it. But they chose to ignore it. <clears throat> All right. So you're truthful. You teach the way of God of truth and defer to no one. So you are not partial to any. All right. The Denny paraphrase of this <laughs> is, Jesus, we think you're tough enough to badmouth the government. We don't think you're going to cower at all when it comes to ripping on the government. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> 
tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? Excuse me. Okay. How is this a trap? Well, if he would have said it's lawful, then he would have alienated himself from the multitudes who bitterly opposed the tax. They hated the tax. They hated the Romans. And they did not want to pay even a wooden nickel to the Romans. So if Jesus says, yeah, it's lawful, then that would have been used, were used against him. But if he would have said it is not lawful, then he would have put himself in opposition to the government and they would have seized him and thrown him in prison. So it's a beautifully crafted question. And it's one of those that really is a trap because either way you go, they got you. Either way you go. But Jesus perceived their malice. There you go, Daniel. <laughs> Cut right through the bat, saw what was going on, read their minds, and said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? All right. So let's talk about you, know, you think I'm, I defer to no one and I speak in truth. All right, let's start out by calling you guys what you really are. A bunch of hypocrites. And then, Jesus didn't have to, but he's going to go ahead and answer their question. Show me the coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar. Then he said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. All right, the answer, then, is not going to upset the Jewish populace, and it's certainly not going to upset the Romans, uh, the Roman government. But yet, the answer is still true. There are some things that are not to be mingled together and considered uh, in the same category. And taxes is something that God expects us to do as part of life. Paul says that very clearly in Romans 13. That we ought to pay taxes uh, to the government. But we also understand that there are things that we need to render to God. And that uh, we've got to give consideration to uh, our level of dedication and commitment and the way that we spend our money for spiritual things. <clears throat> Verse 22, And hearing this, they marveled, and leaving him went away. They thought that their question was so beautifully crafted, there was no way out. We got him with this one. As long as he'll man up and answer it, we got it. <clears throat> well, Jesus comes up with a, uh, an answer they never thought was even possible, and so they marveled. <clears throat> All right, verse 23. Now we have a discussion with the Sadducees, and this goes down through verse 33. And by way of reminder, the Sadducees recognized only the Pentateuch as authoritative. So if you were going to try to make a scriptural point, with the Sadducee, it's going to have to be from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, or Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch. Don't be going to Joshua with the Sadducee. Don't be going to Isaiah with the Sadducee. Because they don't recognize the authority of those books. And, therefore, they saw no teaching regarding the resurrection in these books. So they had concluded that the doctrine of the resurrection was an incorrect doctrine. So 
So they came to question Jesus, saying, Teacher, Moses said, If a man dies having no children, and his brother as next to kin shall marry his wife and raise up an offspring to his brother. This is sometimes referred to as the Leverite Law. And it was designed by God. Notice, first of all, they're quoting a passage from the Pentateuch, which they acknowledged as authoritative. And the idea was that you did not want to leave uh, a widow without a posterity, without children. And so it was God's plan that the next brother... Uh, in age, be one that uh, would father a child uh, with this uh, woman, and then the child that she would bear would actually be considered not his, but his dead brother's uh, son. All right, so they have then, based upon that law, a hypothetical now, there were seven brothers with us. This might be more than a hypothetical. Some scholars believe this actually did happen. And the first married and died, having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So also the second, meaning the second brother, uh, also tried to get her pregnant and failed. And the third, down to the seventh. Um, and each one died uh, without having succeeded in getting her freight. I kept thinking and joking that if I were the seventh brother, there's no way I would have anything to do with this woman. She's trouble. <laughs> but anyway, I, uh, I digress. <laughs> so the thought is that, I guess when I read it, I just assumed that the guy would take, take the gal and then just something would happen just immediately. Is that, I mean... No, as a matter of fact, we read about this guy named Onan. Onan, did, he just enjoyed the sex. And so he kept pulling himself out before leaving his seat, and that was so he could keep doing it. Because as soon as she got pregnant, then that was done. Right. And, uh, but, okay. Anyway. Now, we also see uh, another aspect of this Leverite law in the book of Ruth because uh, Ruth was a widow and the, uh, the nearest of kin was to be her what in Hebrew is Goel to be the Goel, the Redeemer and um, so as they're meeting at the gates of the city the man says this woman is your responsibility and we have thought, or there have been some that have thought, that his only responsibility was to get her pregnant. But we learn in the book of Ruth that not only are you to father a son, but you are also now financially responsible for that family. And so the, the nearest of kin says, I can't take on that responsibility. And he says, uh, are you willing then to, Boaz says, are you willing then for me to take on that responsibility? And he says that he is, and they do the, the little shoe deal as an uh, um, application or uh, illustration of the covenant being made on that day. And so now Boaz is assuming full responsibility for Ruth. Uh, well, that's all a part of this uh, Leverite law. Okay, so with their illustration, you've got seven brothers. That's the perfect number of brothers, a full complement of brothers that all had this woman as a wife, according to the Leverite law, that all had her sexually, we presume. All right, so there, here is the question. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of the seven shall they be, for they all had her. Now, this was such a powerful argument because in part of the Jewish prejudice, the thought of their having many women 
they could deal with that. But the idea of a woman having several men, well, that there's just no way that could be right. There's no way that could be. And, and so in the resurrection, if there is such a thing, now you've got the prospect of a woman that's got seven men. Well, that was a slam dunk proof that the resurrection was a hoax. The resurrection was a joke. Because now you've got an, a completely unacceptable situation that has developed where you've got a woman with seven husbands. Verse 29 is the key. Jesus says, you are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures, are the power of God. Now, the New King James has uh, in their footnote the word deceived. Error is the, the way that the King James translates this. This is a Greek word that is used in a number of places in the scripture, like Romans 1, 27, to describe homosexuality. Now, I point this out because this particular word is not just a, well, you guys are a little bit off. There are some points here that I need to fine-tune in your thinking. <laughs> this is a Greek word that means this is a damnable <coughs> that you are holding. It is something that is going to impact one's eternal salvation just like homosexuality is that which will impact a person's eternal destiny. All right, here's the Greek word for those of you that would like to get it in your notes. It's P-L-A-N-A-S-T-H-E. Bonaste. Do you have a strong number for it? No, I don't. Plotnase. All right, so you've got it in Romans 1.28. You've got it in 1 Corinthians 15.33. Uh, and a number of other places. As a matter of fact, as um, that one brother during the lectureship was walking us through uh, 2 Timothy, uh when Paul talks about uh, evil men that are going to be going from bad to worse, <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 3, um, Verse 13, deceiving and being deceived. That's the same word. 2 Timothy 3, um, verse 13. Okay, my point then is this. This doctrine that there is no resurrection was a damnable doctrine because of where it led the Sadducees. It led them to believe that you really don't have to concern yourself about Judgment Day or to concern yourself about the prospect of an eternity in heaven or hell. Now imagine how your life would be different if all there was was this life, if all there was was your 70, 80, 90 years, however many years you live, and then you die and that's it. 
and there are no there are going to be no consequences beyond this life whatsoever. Would you be different? Would you act different? Would you make different choices? Well, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that without the resurrection, we are men most to be pitied. Because we're making choices to not party on, dude. <laughs> we're making choices to live righteously and give our money to the church when we could be spending that money on the partying and the women and the alcohol and the the Sadducees had taken away the moral foundation of their existence by a failure to recognize the doctrine of the resurrection. So, you are mistaken. Now, Jesus, after telling them, he said, you are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures, that was their first mistake, they really didn't have a good handle on the Word of God. And that had led them to this false doctrine. And so it is today. Men that have incorrect doctrines do so because of an incorrect understanding of Scripture. Second problem that they have is they don't understand the power of God. Is God not able to somehow figure out how to make this work. I mean, they saw a woman with seven husbands as a deal breaker. Nobody could ever come up with a solution to that horrible scenario. And Jesus says, you really don't know God very well, do you? You don't know the power of God. And how a prospect like that is a simple solution. Then Jesus tells them something that they had never even considered. In the, rex, in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. You see, there was an assumption that they had made, the Pharisees had made, that marriage extended into eternity. And the Sadducees were able to get traction with this doctrine because of a misunderstanding on the part of the Pharisees. <clears throat> Jesus says, in the resurrection, there is no marriage. You're not going to be married. You're not going to be given in marriage. But you're going to be like the angels. The angels do not marry. Well... Wow, that was a thought that they had never even considered, nor had the Pharisees even considered. Now that Jesus has answered their question, he wants to correct their false doctrine. In regard, but regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken to you by God? I love that. I use that. When God gives us his word, he's speaking to you. Say, now wait a minute. When Moses wrote that, he was talking to those Jews 1,400 years ago. When you've got somebody, and you will have somebody, that's a part of this new hermeneutic camp, that will say, stop going to Romans. Did you not read? It was written to the Romans, to the Corinthians, to the Galatians. Where does it say to Dini? It never says that. So why do you why do you keep saying that? You know we're responsible for that. There, where's the epistle to Bear Valley? Jesus says, "Have you not read?" That which was spoken to you by God. When he gives scripture, he's talking to me. Yeah, he was talking to the Romans, or the Galatians, or the Corinthians, but he was talking to me. 
And then Jesus quotes Exodus 3 and verse 6. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Have you not read that? All right, so what we see here is the argument of Jesus that comes from Exodus chapter 3 and verse 6. The argument is this. I am, not I was, but I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then Jesus points out, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. If he was the God of the dead, then he would have said, I was their God. But he didn't say, I was their God. He says, I am their God. Now, the reason that this argument is so powerful is it's coming from the Pentateuch. It's coming from those five books that they recognized, the Sadducees did, as authoritative. So, the conclusion, the ungetaroundable conclusion, is that A, I, and J, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, must still be alive. All right, let's test your Bible uh, knowledge of chronology. Abraham lived approximately when? Okay. 2000 AD? 2000. Easy date to remember. Abraham was 2000, David was 1000. Just remember that. All right. How long after Abraham was Moses? 600 years. So, we're talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob being dead for hundreds of years. <coughs> hundreds of years. But yet, God is saying in the days of Moses, I am their God. So they must still be alive. Well, that proves the doctrine of the resurrection. Now, when I teach hermeneutics, I make a big deal about this text. And here's why. Those of the new hermeneutic camp have said only commands are binding. <clears throat> that their God is never ever going to hold us responsible for an example or for something that is an inference. God is, isn't that kind of God. He's not going to do that to us. It would be unfair and unjust and they go off on uh, talking about the character of God. How could God hold us responsible for something that he doesn't just lay out there in plain black and white? This text is one of the most powerful <coughs> arguments to defeat that because there was no direct statement or a command about the resurrection. God expected the Sadducees to reason through something that was only implied by God. It was only implied. And, but yet, he said, Planeste, you err. You are mistaken. You are have basing your life on a sinful, damnable doctrine. Why? Because they are failing to see 
a clear black and white doctrine of God? No, because they fail to see something that God has implied. <clears throat> and that's all. So if you want a passage to show that we are responsible for all of God's word, not just what he lays out in command language, then this is your text. One of many, but it's a good one. All we're talking about is the difference of a verb tense, I am versus I was. And, man, talk about a high wow factor. This is a big wow. But it teaches us about God. And it reminds us of the truth of Isaiah 55, 8. Where God says, my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. And so we've got these today in the church that are saying, God's only going to hold us responsible for that which is in command language. But then we see texts like this that clearly show that's just simply not true. So someone would say, Danny, do you honestly believe that in Ephesians 5, Paul's trying to teach us, about a cappella music versus the instrument. You honestly think that's what he's talking about? Well, I can tell by the way he's asking me this question that he's gotten some good traction with that. Said, no, he, that's not what he's talking about. But truth is learned through, you know, secondary observation. And when you look at Ephesians 5, we see what spiritual worship is all about, but in the process, we also see that God wants us to worship with our hearts and with our mouths. And that's all that he's asking for. So that's what we learn as a secondary truth, but it's still that which is a truth revealed. So when you go back to Exodus 3, is the point of Exodus 3, 6 to prove the doctrine of the resurrection? No. The point was that Moses is not feeling secure in going to his own people and telling them, who do I say sent me? Well, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's who you go tell them sent you. That's the context. There's nothing in there about, I'm trying to prove the doctrine of the resurrection in this statement. That's not at all the point. <clears throat> But that is the point that the Sadducees should have learned. And Jesus is saying, it's a damnable doctrine that you hold because you fail to see something that God implied. Okay, anybody missing that? Do I need to walk you through that one more time or you got it? I have not that kind of question, but I want to ask. They believe that... that uh, we only go by commands, but at the same time, they don't believe that we should go by anything that is written to somebody else. Well, it's all written to somebody else, to some aspects, so aren't they kind of closing in on themselves as far as what they believe at all? And that's what's happened. <clears throat> that's what's happened in that now the commands are being reduced in significance because, well, that was what Paul commanded the Corinthians, not what Paul commanded their about. Um, so we might get some general ideas or principles from that, but to say that that is a hard and fast legislation for Bear Valley is ridiculous. And go back and look, it says it's to the Corinthians. Um, so that's kind of where they had to go. And so now even commands, and, and they're not even in agreement among themselves, but uh, now the commands are, are no longer... Fine. So, so what would they do in the instances where some of the letters you can see that they were basically copied and passed around to the other congregations, even though they were originally written to somebody at some a certain place? They're using it everywhere. Where what what do they say to something like that? What's the point of them doing that if it doesn't matter to them? Um, they they have a problem with that for starters. That really is a good argument. Second of all, when the, they have tried to answer that. They still say, that's first century doctrine. We're talking about a young, immature, ignorant church. 
We're the church of the 21st century. We've been at this thing for, you know, over 2,000 years now. We know what we're doing. And the common thing is we know how to do church. And their, their passage that they use, and we've already been there, is right here in Matthew where he's talking about the whole wine schemes. And they're accusing us of trying to put, uh, you know, new wine into old wine schemes. Uh, you're trying to put 21st century Christianity into 1st century wine skin. And it's going to bust, and it's a failure, and they'll already say, look at your churches. You you conservative, uh, old hermeneutic churches are dying. Uh, you're, you're busted wine skins. So um, that's, uh, that's their approach in uh, trying to answer all of this. Could I uh, ask you to go back and speak briefly on the angels marrying, not marrying, based off the passages in Genesis and the whole conversation there? Yeah. The uh, uh, when angels act like men and take the form of men, they do what men do. For example, the angels in heaven eat. No, they're spiritual beings. Why would they need to eat? But we have record of angels taking the form of men and eating. Like Abraham entertains uh, angels and he feeds them. Alright, so when we talk about when angels are among men, they have human characteristics. They do things that humans do. And so, uh, you know, Jesus is talking about angels in heaven neither marry nor marry. And so that's that's not a uh, a deal breaker for Genesis six having reference to angels. So you would you would say then that it's not that the angels cannot marry. They don't because they are in heaven and trying to do God's will. Because on earth they lived as humans. Well, and I think the food thing is a perfect illustration of that. Um, you know. They did what we do on earth. Okay, other questions? Yes. How old is this new hermeneutic? Uh, basically, 1989. That's where it really started. 1989. Yet they say they've been at it for 2,000 years. Yeah. Yeah, but we can we can trace it back to um, the one one guy, one lecture. Well, where it all began. Uh, Who was that? Um, that was an Oklahoma City uh, lecture by a guy by the name of Uh The Church Association. Uh, I don't, I don't remember. Um, but anyway, it was a, it was an Oklahoma Christian lecture, so. and he was supposed to be given a talk on First Corinthians four, and not to go, to go beyond what is written, and uh, he. Went beyond what was written. They didn't pull him off with a cane. Uh, <laughs> they, there was a, a guy that got up afterwards and said what he just taught us was wrong. Um, so, and they may have cut him off before he finished. But I don't think they did. I, I wasn't there. So. Okay. When the multitudes heard this, they were astonished. At his teaching. Verse 22, they marveled. Now in verse 33, they're astonished. Jesus just keeps on giving amazing teachings that, you know, they thought they had it all figured out. Uh, and they're learning that they don't have it figured out. And you know what? I do make application to Denny when I read stuff like this. Because... I need to constantly be in the Word. Because I don't have it all figured out. And I've got to let the Bible be what formulates what I think, what I believe, what I teach. Otherwise, I'm not going to be any better than the Pharisees and Sadducees. I'm going to be exactly in the same boat as they where I take a few scriptures 
and I formulate my own doctrine, and that's wrong doctrine. And even a damnable doctrine like the Sadducees uh, had embraced. So that's why I am such a big fan of exegesis. I really, uh, you guys heard my, my lecture on that, but um, there's nothing I know that will keep you in the Word and letting the Word teach you better than exegesis. There's just nothing else out there. <coughs> All right, verse 34, but when the Pharisees heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence. Now, that's interesting, and it gives us somewhat of a glimpse of what was going on. It's Jesus and the Sadducees, but the Pharisees are sitting here listening to the whole thing, and you got to believe that they never could answer that argument. That was an ungetaroundable argument to them. And Jesus had just destroyed it. silence of the Sadducees was speaking volumes. There was nothing they could say in reply to what Jesus just taught them. All right, they gathered themselves together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. So, uh, chapter 22 seems to be the test chapter, uh, because we've got one after the other after the other. And it's right on the heels of the three parables where Jesus was exposing the hypocrisy and evil of the scribes and Pharisees. All right, so now we've got a very smart guy, an expert in Mosaic law, a lawyer, and he's got a question. Teacher, which is the great commandment? in the law. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. All right, how could that have been a trap? How could that question, what's the greatest commandment, have been a test? He lived out there with like yeah, I think to some level that's a possibility. Because you're going to have, well, Jesus doesn't recognize all of the, the law. They had 613 commandments that they had counted. Uh, well, Jesus only goes with one. Are you telling me that he ignored 612 of them? Well, apparently. We asked him. Somehow or another, it was going to be recloaked that Jesus doesn't honor all of Mosaic law. He says, The second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. All right, let's talk a little bit about these three points. If you love God with all your heart, this has to do with an emotional commitment to God, not just going through the motions, paying lip service, but obeying because we are emotionally attached to the Lord. To love God with all your soul, this is the spiritual part of man, given all that we have to him. We don't let anybody else share our spiritual throne.
Then third, Jesus says that we need to love God with all our mind. Reason, intellect. We know Him. We know what He teaches. We study His law. Now, Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy 6, 5. So he actually is bringing them to an Old Testament text in answering the question. But if you love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, then you're not going to ignore his laws on animal sacrifice. You're not going to ignore his laws about the Sabbath. You're not going to ignore his laws regarding free trip to Jerusalem or anything else. And so, again, this was a trap, but Jesus' answer is so perfectly crafted that it's obvious that he has given respect to all of the Old Testament because if you love God, you're not going to ignore anything. You're not going to minimize anything. All right, then he says, the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So with the greatest commandment, the second is like it, in that love is the key to both commandments. Loving God, but also loving neighbor. And this is so beautifully expressed, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, I have to admit, I... <laughs> take good care of me. <laughs> you know, when I'm tired, what I do, I See? find a comfortable place to lay down and I give myself some shut up. You know, when I'm hungry, what I do, I feed myself. <laughs> and you know what? When, when I've got a scratch, man, I'm getting medicine and band aids and. I mean, I am pampering myself. It's sickening. You know why I do that? Because I love me. Love your neighbor as yourself. You don't tell ugly stories on yourself. You don't spread rumors about you. You take care of yourself. Love others the way you love you. And there's nothing wrong with loving you. But when you become greater than the way that you treat others, that's where you fall into sin. Paul even goes so far in Philippians 2 to say that we ought to consider others above ourselves. Verses 3 and 4. Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. All right, on these two commandments depend the whole law and prophets. So Jesus then completely dispels the, the trap by saying those two are the foundation of everything else. If you don't love God, then you're not going to offer sacrifices. If you don't love God, you're not going to make free trip to Jerusalem. If we don't love God, there's no church, there's no faithful husbands, there's no studying His Word, there's no bowing the, uh, the head in prayer. Everything that's commanded of us is contingent upon L-O-V-E. Without that, Everything else is either going to be absent or empty. Verse 41. We're not done with the questions. Now, while the... So this is the, the question chapter. Chapter 22. Pharisees gathered together. Jesus asked them a question. 
What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. All right, so one final exchange. Only this time Jesus is the one asking the question. And his question is based upon Psalm 110 and verse 1. I do. The Messiah. Whose son is the Messiah? Well, they had to think this is the easiest question ever asked. No brainer of David. He said to them, Then, how does David in the spirit? What does that mean? Inspired. How does David, inspired to say this, say, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put thine enemies beneath thy feet. Now, they thought that a son was inferior to the father. Therefore, they thought the Messiah was going to be inferior to to David. Hmm. I mean, a son is great, but a son is never as great as a father. So, with that belief, they assumed that the Messiah was going to be inferior to David when he ever showed up. So, the question, based on Psalm 110, is David was inspired to call the Messiah Lord. This proved that the Messiah was superior to David. And this is because the Messiah is God. By the way, this is another necessary inference. You should have been able to reason that the Messiah was superior to David. Not because there was any Old Testament text that said that clearly. Or any Old Testament text that said the Messiah is going to be God. That you should have been able to infer that from Psalm 110, verse 1. <coughs> so if David then calls him Lord, how then is he his son? Wow. Verse 46, no one was able to answer him a word. <coughs> this is one of those questions that, wow, don't know. So <coughs> the Pharisees now realized, finally, they were outmatched. And they didn't attempt to ask him any more questions. Good call. Now, 
If they had asked questions because they were sincere truth seekers, that would have been one thing. Jesus would have been happy to have answered all of their questions. But what we're seeing in chapter 22 is that their questions were all traps. They were not truth seekers. They were intending to trap him. And every time they end up looking like the fools, they end up looking like the ignoramuses of God's law. And so they finally smarted up and said, maybe we need to stop asking this guy questions. All right, Matthew 23 is our fifth speech section. Out of how many? How many we got after this one? This is it. Nobody find you lunch. This is it. The last speech section and it goes through chapter 25. It's the most direct scathing of the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus had had three years of dealing with them and chapter 23 is where he just lets the bullets fly. They were hypocrites because they taught the law of Moses and affirmed its authority, but their deeds asserted their own authority, thereby denying God's authority. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples. Now, note that what he is about to say was not spoken to the scribes and Pharisees. A lot of times we get off track and, and we think that Jesus is blasting them directly, but that's not what the text says. The text says that these are words that were spoken to the multitudes about the scribes and Pharisees. And to the disciples about the scribes and Pharisees. Would it be logical to assume, though, that there would have been some in there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're there. No doubt about it. The scribes and Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe. When it comes down to being teachers of Mosaic law, they got that part right. They were not leading the people astray when they were explaining Leviticus. But do not do according to their deeds. For they say things and do not do them. Alright, so here is the problem. The problem is they didn't practice what they preached. They had a different standard for themselves. They taught the people to do one thing while they themselves were at liberty to do something else. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, earlier we read that Jesus had said, you know, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, and then it said flat out, beware of the teachings. So how would you take that passage and gel it with uh, the same here? Because he is specifically saying what they teach about the law of Moses is right. He's already shown that what they're teaching about their um, is wrong. Yeah. And when we talk about what being bound on them, uh, that, that's getting into the missionist type stuff. And that's what Jesus is referring to in verse 4. They tie up heavy loads and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves were unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. In Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. The heavy load that Jesus had, or that the Pharisees had put on the people's shoulders, had so wearied them and discouraged them that they had, been, they had given up. Traditions, the plucking of grain, the washing of hands, 
they were not willing to even lift a finger to honor those particular regulations themselves. Verse 5, but they do all their deeds to be noticed by men. All right, let's just cut to the chase. Jesus, who knows men, knows the hearts of men, knows why they do what they do, why they teach what they teach, and that is to be seen of men. All right, like what? What are they doing to be seen of men? Well, he gives us a list of six case in points. First, they broaden their phylacteries. <laughs> I was wondering who was going to say it. <laughs> the phylacteries were those that uh, were typically a headband that had a string, and on the string was a box. And the box had a little door in it, or sometimes it was written on the box itself, and the little door inside would have a piece of paper upon which was written scripture. And so, as they would walk, their phylactery would be going, going, bouncing them in the head as a continual reminder that they needed to follow whatever it was, whatever scripture was in that particular box, their phylactery. Well, now they're making bigger boxes. And you can imagine... How funny that must have been, but some guy that's got a box that's as big as an orange, <laughs> well, he's more spiritual than the guy over there that's got a box the size of a ping pong ball. Well, and then phylacteries were sometimes like wristbands. They were leather wristbands upon which you had scripture that was written on these and they're broadening their phylacteries, so eventually you've got a guy that now it's you know it's several inches wide. Well, this guy's not going to be outdone, hmm. so now he's got a phylactery that goes all the way to the elbow. Well, he's not going to be outdone, so he's going to get a phylactery that goes all the way up to the shoulder. So now you've got guys walking around with these phylacteries. <laughs> It was all to be seen of men. And so you see a guy that's got a phylactery that's from, uh, you know, wrist to shoulder, and it's got scripture written all the way, all the way. Man, oh man, that is one spiritual guy. <laughs> it's got to be. Got to be. <clears throat> I'm guessing these are worn on the outside of the oh, garments. Yeah. yeah, to be seen of men. And are the scriptures written on the outside or the inside of the phylactery? On the outside. Well, I mean, the, the little thing in the box. Uh, so, on, let's say on this one. Is it so that people can see it, or is it on the inside so that only... No, it's, it's so people can see it. Okay. Now, we've discovered, actually, um, <coughs> what is considered to be the oldest copy of Scripture was um, little bitty gold, almost leaflets, but they were rolled up like a scroll-like, but they were very tiny. Um, and they had number six. You shall, um, uh, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift his face upon you and shine upon you. That was written on these. Well, they're so small that they're believed to have been that which was somebody kept in a phylactery. Um, and that's the oldest copy of an Old Testament text that's ever been found. It's somewhere uh, you know, around thousand or twelve hundred BC. How twelve hundred BC? Yeah. How long did they uh, have they been using those? That's not anywhere in scripture, is it? The, the no, but see they get it from Deuteronomy six. Um, where um, he said, bind them on your hands and on your foreheads. Oh. These laws that I'm giving you today, bind that's they took that very literally. Oh. And that's where the <laughs> you know, though, I've read that many times that Deuteronomy 6 
And if we actually lived by that today, not the phylacteries, but encompassing our whole world around what God asks of us and His communication with us, I mean, where would we be at? Yeah. I'm going to try. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to try to out too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't let him one up here. Really. No way. <laughs> not, not in the phylactery arena. We've got it. <laughs> <laughs> what was the significance? You can't wear a Raiders phylactery. Okay, were there scripture on it? I mean, what was. Yeah. Are you talking about the, the link in the castle of their Yeah. Yeah. That's the second one. See, we're just not that fancy. We use three by five index cards now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we, if we were impressed, we're not really. Uh, okay. So the, the second thing that they do to be seen of men is they lengthen the tassels of their garments. What rabbis did in the first century is they had garments that demonstrated that they were teachers, that they were rabbis. And they were done. Uh, by tassels. Now, visualize what we're talking about. For example, they wore robes. We, we, we get that. Well, the robes would be those that uh, the actual solid piece of cloth would go to about your cap. And then you would have tassels that would hang down from your cap down to uh, the ground. Now, you think, I'm not sure I know what a tassel is. You know what you have when you graduate, the little thing that's on your... That's what we're talking about. Something that's got a string that then is tied with a lot of strings below that. <coughs> and so um, they would lengthen the tassels so that it became something that now is turning into something similar to a bridal gown with a train behind it. Huh. They're lengthening the tassel, their garments. And so now you've got this rabbi walking by, and, you know, he walked by two minutes ago, and his tassels are still, you know. Uh, well, he's obviously got to be super spiritual. I mean, good grief, look at the tassels on that. Did they ever do, like, a mini skirt version? Tassels <laughs> 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 tassels. Like kind of the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> Shortening of the robe and then now they, longer tassels. As far as we know, they, they never had the tassels higher than the cap. <laughs> but they extended them onto the ground like a, a bridal, uh, the train of a bridal gown. Sweet tassels. Four or more shirts you're carrying them, then you're really good. Yeah. They probably did. I mean, you're, you're joking, but they probably had attendants that were carrying, uh, you know, that, uh, that train of tassels uh, behind them. So they okay, does that answer your question? Yeah. Have, oh, her. Sorry. You're making me laugh, though. I don't know about her. <laughs> yeah, I just, I mean, I get the flatteries, I mean, having the scripture, but the tassels, I don't understand where that even came from. Yeah, the only because that was the garment of a, of a rabbi. And so they wanted not only to be identified as a rabbi, but they also wanted to separate themselves from the other rabbis by the length of these tassels. Um, when, you, when you look at the Greek, you know the story about the woman with the hemorrhage, and she says, if I just touch the hem of his garment? Um, well, what she's actually saying is, if I could just touch one of his tassels. So Jesus was wearing garments that identified his, him as a rabbi which may explain why there were people that just came up and said, Rabbi, uh, well, because he did wear the garments of a rabbi. The third thing they were doing to be seen of men was they wanted the place of honor at banquets. The banquets were those where, if they were a formal banquet, the guests were all in this large U shape. We've talked about that before, right? Where you're laying on your left uh, arm, and then the, the top of the U is where the servants are able to come in and serve all of the guests. Well, 
the, the ones at the very top of the U were the chief seats, the, the, the chief places. And so they wanted and expected to have those places at banquets. And then related to that, they loved the chief seats in the synagogue. Now, the chief seats in the synagogue are not the front row. They were the seats that are behind the speaker. Now, in most auditoriums, and Bear Valley is not an exception, we've got seats behind the podium, right? You know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> That's where these guys wanted to sit. So, while this guy's speaking, if you just shift your eyes ever so slightly, there's one of these Pharisees. And he's going... <laughs> or he's going... <laughs> Double time this thing. Yeah. So, you know, they, that's the position they wanted to be in. Well, that's what we're talking about. Did you say that was like them two still be wanting to be seen by just by men, be recognized by men, like by sitting, by sitting behind the speaker? Yeah. 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 See, they're not gonna. If they're sitting on the front row. They're not yeah. being seen of men. <laughs> but if they're behind the speaker, then uh, they're they're right there visible. That kind of carried over the like the 1800s and stuff too, because I know that. Like the theaters that the presidents used to go to, like where Lincoln was at and stuff, the, the seats on the stage became very coveted. I mean, like it wasn't enough to come in late and have everybody stand up and applaud, but like they started actually sitting on the stage where the actors were. Yeah. You know, it kind of became all about them, too. Yeah, it's all about them. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we went to uh, uh, one place when we were in, in Rome in which um, it was one of those places, uh, a Roman Catholic uh, place where you had bishops and cardinals and so on. And the stage had like 280 seats behind the podium. Huh. I mean, talk about a lot of people that wanted to be, you know, not looking at the speaker, but they wanted to be behind the speaker. <laughs> like, what's up with that? Well, those were the top guys back there. So we went to Africa last summer. Um, that was their way of honoring us. And I hated it. They'd want to put us up behind the speaker and the audience would be out there and they'd want us sitting up there. A lot of times I sneak out and sit in the audience. But I didn't, I didn't like it. That's what they wanted. That was their way of honoring us. It wasn't, I don't, I didn't like it though. Well, sure. I am bringing I stand up and I say, oh, real quick, a funny story about that. Darrow was the only one sitting it's, up there. Um, uh, Dead Landon, Keith Kasarjan, and I were on a program in Panama City, Panama. And it was an unbelievably, miserably hot and humid day. And um, they were all speaking in Spanish, in which none of us know Spanish. But they wanted us on the stage anyway. And so all of us are hot and we're tired and we don't understand what's being said anyway. And so... You know, <laughs> all three of us, we are dead out. <laughs> you know, it's not a lot of these guys. I mean, it's like, well, I don't know that anybody got any pictures, but oh, you know, he, he said his, his head slap got so hard that he's, he looked over his head and he had both of them. <laughs> <laughs> Not sit us behind the speaker. <laughs> <laughs> How many people were out there watching? Yeah. Huh? How many people were watching? Like 280. <laughs> <laughs> it was a big deal. The place was packed. It was so it was funny. Was Did any of the locals ever say anything to you guys about sleeping on stage? No. Well, they just talked behind our backs, I'm sure. Oh, man. <laughs> you know, so I, awesome. put that, I put that in my, uh, my volume of Diddy's most important. <laughs> Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's getting thicker all the time too, unfortunately. <laughs> I keep adding to the collection. 
of embarrassing women from one of those guys. Hopefully you don't know if you tap. But see, Keith Kassarjan, you know who Keith Kassarjan is? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Bye-bye. He, he's part of the problem because he loves to keep telling these stories. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> if he would just be quiet, they would maybe go away. But <laughs> yeah, I can see how that goes. So right. Were you guys as phylacteries bouncing back and forth as you, <laughs> <laughs> as you were sitting up? As you nodded off? Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. Next, what they like to be seen of men is they like being called rabbi. You did hit on the greetings. Um, oh, yeah, respectful greetings in marketplace. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> they like titles. They like uh, people honoring them, acknowledging them uh, in uh, public venues like the marketplaces. So would this be like a greeting when they walked up to buy an orange? They'd be the, the seller would be oh great. And, Merciful, masterful. Yeah, and also, you know, you go up to, to uh, buy something at the market, and the guy that is the um, the guy selling the product. Does everybody know Rabbi Denny? Yeah, have everybody. This has got to be one of the best rabbis ever. <laughs> um, this this guy, you, you, got, you got to meet him. That's the kind of stuff we're talking about. They wanted and expected that sort of thing. And so they frequented the marketplace uh, in order to get as many accolades from their way as possible. Now, <clears throat> what we learn in the next several verses is God does not want men to wear religious titles. Jesus says, but do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father who is in heaven. And do not be called leaders, for one is your leader, that is Christ. But the greatest among you <coughs> shall be your servant. So we're continuing to dwell on this general principle all the way back into chapter 19 about the greatest and the least, the first, last. Those are the predominant, that is the predominant idea in Matthew going all the way back to chapter 19. The scribes and Pharisees wanted to be the top dogs. Now, the wearing of religious titles is something that is clearly condemned by Jesus. And it is amazing that we would have a major religious group, the Catholics, that would have men that are called Father. When Jesus specifically says, that word, call no man father. Now, it has been my experience that most Catholics have never seen this verse before. I probably in my life have studied with 50 or 60 Catholics, and they go, I have never seen that. The few that have seen it, and I've had studies with Catholic priests before, their answer to that is, so you you can't call your dad father? That'd be sinful, to call your dad father? And <clears throat> that's, that's as, as good as they can come up with. Hmm. All right, so uh, the answer, though, is as always, context. And in context, if you're calling your dad father, is that a religious title? <coughs> what we're talking about are things to be seen of men. Labels that are being attached to someone in order to separate them from the rest. 
And so any kind of religious title is something that is unacceptable. Now, we have to be careful with this in the Lord's Church, lest we stand in violation of it. I remember when I was being introduced to people uh, in Como, Mississippi, there was a community uh, kind of a picnic. And there were a bunch of us, about five or six, no, it was more than that, like 10 or 11 people in a circle. And one of the members of the church uh, was introducing everybody. This is George, and this is Sue, and this is Sam, and that's Kelly, and that's and that's Brother Patrillo, and that's... Why wasn't I Denny? Why was I Brother Patrillo? Well, that became a religious title. It was something of which I was separated by designation from everybody else. And that's not right. Jesus says here that you are all brothers. You are all, verse 8, um, one is your teacher, and you're all brothers. You're all equal. There's not anybody that's greater than anyone else. Now, people have said, Denny, you have a PhD. Why, why don't people call you Dr. Petrolo? This is the answer. Because I believe it's wrong. I believe it's sinful to use religious titles that separate anybody from anybody else. Now, I will do things, will write things for a scholarly journal, for example, and I'll put Ph.D. after my name. That's an academic designation, but it's not a religious title. What you're doing is you're, you're indicating uh, your, your level of education, but it's not a religious title. Now, occasionally, and Bill Stewart is one that does this probably more than anybody else, you know, we're going to have Dr. Petrello come and lead us in a closing prayer. Well, I, it's harmless, but I don't like it. Uh, and, you know, I encourage people not to do it. And if you end up getting a doctorate, I would hope that you do the same. We cannot violate what Jesus teaches here and start separating ourselves from one another with designation, lest we become guilty of the same sin that they were guilty of. We're all brothers. That's who we are. And that's the way it's got to stay. And titles have a tendency to separate uh, people. And that's why we don't call Elder Hanstock. Well, is he an elder? Yeah. And would he be wrong to say in a, that it, Mark Hanstein, Bear Valley Elder? No, because that's who he is. But that's not a title. It's not a religious title. How would you feel about um, the PhD being used um, in the academic world, not associated with the church? Um, for example, if you're trying to persuade someone else from a different faith to let them know that you do know something about this. Yeah, as long as it's academic, you're saying there's not an issue. But if it's used to bring glory to your intelligence in the yeah. church as well. You know, and I've wondered about that. Um, like, if I if I go speak on, like I speak, I've spoken at Creed Hardman, I've spoken mm -hmm. at Moore College, I've spoken a lot of, well, everything is Dr. Petrillo while I'm, I'm in that academic environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and while I'm not totally comfortable with it, I kind of get that Understand. that's not the church. And so, uh, in that particular environment, I'm maybe a little bit more accepting of the practice. So do you think there is a time that you should have some separation? I'm not saying you specifically, but is, yeah. there, is there a time that, that, I, that needs to be separated? I can see how uh, there, there might be. Uh, okay. And like a university setting might be an example of that. Okay. But me personally, I don't like it even there. <clears throat> Talking about what the Catholic Church does with regards to the term father, but they're actually doing all of these things. 
whether if you're a priest, you wear the special little collar to designate yourself as being a priest so that people can see who you are. If you're a bishop, maybe you've got a stole or something else that you're wearing, you know, all the way up to the Pope wearing, you know, the, the big hat to, to say, okay, here's somebody who's on a higher level. And wanting chief seats and everything else. A few years ago, I was on a plane sitting next to a Catholic priest who was coming back from Russia, and he's been half the flight complaining about the fact that Aeroflot had not catered to him as being special above all the other passengers that were on the plane. He had to sit back with you peons, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what happens, and that's what was happening in the first century. It's pretty prevalent today, though, isn't it? I mean, I mean like my whole congregation, my preacher up there, he comments all the time when he's asked to do funerals for other people in different congregations, and the people, they've just been, it's been ingrained into them to pastor such and such, or reverend such and such, and just yeah. fringes inside. Like, yeah. Don't call me that. That's our world. And the, the climate of denominationalism has created this monster. And, um, you know, I've, I've been called just about every day in the book, uh, you know, <laughs> reverend, most reverend, pastor, uh, you, you name it. Yeah, most excellent. <laughs> I don't think I've been called that. <laughs> <laughs> most average. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe that's... Danny, I was just wondering, when people call you pastor and just, uh, you know, if you're just having a general conversation and they say, oh, well, it's so nice that you're a pastor, do you take that moment in which you just those that short time that you've met that person to go through and well I'm not a pastor I'm a preacher or do you just kind of let it slide depends depends like on like on, on an airplane yeah. not too long ago someone said man it's so great that you're a pastor I said no actually I'm not a pastor and I said did you know that in the Bible a pastor is that and then I and so, so I tried to uh, say you know I'm not that this is uh, so I'm actually a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a bad part of a doctor, so please. <laughs> so basically, you'll, you'll explain to someone who's trapped by you for a certain amount of time? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, if, if they're on the hot seat, not so much. But if they're at the window, yeah. they can't, they can't, they can't. where are they going to go? Yeah, right? Not yet, not yet. Don't open that window. <laughs> All right, so the context then is indicating the point, and that is uh, religious titles are those which Jesus is condemning. And the reason is the greatest among you shall be your servant. We're not looking for ways to exalt ourselves, but finding ways in order to be servants. Because I want to be great in the eyes of God, don't you? Yes. Don't you want to be looked at by God like God looked at Job? I do. I want to be great in the eyes of God. And he's telling me how I can do that and how you can do that. And that is serve. And if you're wanting to serve and that's your mentality, then you're not wanting to exalt yourself above anybody with religious titles or anything else. Because he says, verse 12, whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. All right, so we're, we're wanting to be exalted, but it's going to come only when humility is that which is practiced. All right, beginning then with verse 13 and going through verse 30, um, we've got woes, um, the seven woes, and you have information in your syllabus about these seven woes uh, on page 83. Verse 13, woe to, first woe. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from men. For you do not enter yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. All right, so here's somebody that has heard Jesus preach, heard John the Baptist preach, and they're going, you know, what he's saying makes sense. I think I'm going to go be baptized by John. And the scribes and Pharisees, the hypocrites, are saying, hey, you don't want to do that. 
Now, don't, don't sucker for what they're teaching. Don't buy into their lies because they're not teaching the truth. All right, so not only are they themselves not doing what's right, but they are proactive in trying to talk others out of doing that. All right, verse 14 is a verse that does not have good manuscript attestation. You will have a footnote that says this verse is not found in the earliest manuscripts. Um, as a matter of fact, in the textual apparatus in the Greek Bibles, um, they give this an A rating. What's that? No. Which means that they are uh, 90 to 100 percent certain that Matthew did not write this verse. <clears throat> so it just doesn't have good uh, good support at all. Now, uh, Mark 12 and Luke 20 have something similar to it. And so it's, pro it's probably a genuine teaching of Jesus. It just doesn't belong here. All right, so we'll drop down to verse 15, second woe. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel about on sea and land to make one proselyte. Uh, proselyte is a word that means a convert. They are going to great lengths to convert someone to Judaism, to the law of Moses. As a matter of fact, you've heard about the temple being surrounded by various courts. And you had the court for men, the court for women, and then a third court that was what? The court of the Gentiles. Well, who are these guys? They're converts. They're converts to Judaism. And these scribes and Pharisees had gone to great lengths to win people to Judaism. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. So they convert people to a system that is going to condemn their souls for eternity. Yeah. Um, the court of the Gentiles, was that for the proselytes who were not circumcised, and once they've been circumcised, could they now enter? So if you were a proselyte, even if you were, circ even if you were circumcised, you still couldn't go past the court of the Gentiles. No. <clears throat> All right, so here they're demonstrating authority to control who enters the kingdom. They think they have figured out on who is and who isn't a part of the kingdom. Woe number three, verse 16. Woe to you blind guides who say, whoever swears by the temple, that's nothing. In other words, you swear by the temple, eh, it's not obligating. Uh, you don't have to do it. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obligated. You fools and blind men, which is more important, the gold or the temple that sanctified the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, that is nothing. But whoever swears by the offering upon it, he is obligated. You blind men, which is more important, the offering or the altar that sanctifies the offering. Therefore, he who swears, swears both by the altar and by everything on it. <laughs> you see, they're blind. Jesus calls them blind uh, twice in verse, or three times in verse 16, in verse 17, and then again in verse 19. Why they are blind is because they couldn't see that this was wrong. They couldn't see that Swearing by the altar, you're not obligated. Swearing by the temple, you're not obligated. Swearing by the gold, you are. Swearing by the sacrifice on the altar, you are. They couldn't see that that was wrong. That that was clearly lying and deceiving. And so now you've got people saying, yeah, Rob uh, swore to, to pay me $50. Yeah, but did he swear... On the temple or the gold in the temple? <laughs> well, he swore. I know he. I know he swore. You know, it was he swore on the temple. Any, you know, such as fool. That's not, he's not obligated. So, you know, where do I get these rules? Tell me where the rules are. Jesus says, if you swear, swear both the altar and everything on it. 
We swear by the temple, both by the temple and he who dwells within it. Verse 22, he who swears by heaven, swears both by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. Now, one of the, the tractates in the Mishnah says, He who swears by heaven and earth, if he swears falsely, is not guilty of perjury. I mean, it says it right there in the Mishnah. Where is that at? That is uh, Shebuah, S-H-E-B-U-O-T-H, 413. S-H-E-B-U-O-T-H, 413. 